We have a world that is longing for love. Men and women alike, every one of us are genetically coded, wired from our birth to desire relationship. And a part of that is deeply rooted in our sexuality. Every one of us are looking for someone, someone that can truly touch and complete and make my life healthy and whole. You know, my son's 22, and I have more frank talks with my son than, than I do. I mean, you know, my daughter and I have some frank talks, but we, we have the man, the man chatter, uh, you know, with my son, because he's 22, and 22 is kind of right at that uh, testosterone-driven peak that you kind of run through. And, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about, uh, you know, pornography and dating and all that other kind of stuff is I constantly say to him, Buddy, it's all about eating healthy. Because we talked about earlier, we have two desires that drive our lives. The desire for food and the desire for sex. Both are motivating factors in our life. And as we know in both cases, if we eat healthy, we grow stronger. And we get more out of life. It becomes vibrant. And if we eat in an unhealthy way, we almost always end up with dysfunction in our life. So as we begin to look at this topic today, we're going to be looking at what does the Bible say about eating healthy. Now, this morning I'm going to be sharing and also Pastor Jennifer is going to be sharing because I don't want to have to try to share from a woman's point of view, even though I'm a very sensitive guy. And I, no. But you need to hear you know, from a woman as well as you need to hear from a man when we begin to talk about this topic. Disclaimer, we can only share from our own experience. I mean, you know, I can't speak for every man on the planet. I can only speak for what I have experienced and what I know. Jennifer can't speak for every woman. But we also, over the years of ministry, have had the opportunity to have, uh, you know, hundreds of people in our offices that have talked about their experiences and their wounds and their brokenness. So we bring along with us also a lot of understanding of other uh, circumstances and situations. And our hope is this morning uh, we can give you a very balanced picture of where healthy uh, is, where life is found, and where sexual fulfillment uh, comes to uh, its peak because we want that for every person. Can you know, C.S. Lewis, oh, I'm sorry, did you have something? Can you tell them about your bumper sticker, Hope? I can't remember what I said in the first service. What did I say? That you, your goal is to have everyone at God Why have a bumper sticker that says God Why has great sex. Yes. <laughs> that, that was it. I forgot. Yeah. I'm glad, thank you for reminding yeah. me. Yeah. No, I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, I would love to have you know, God Why couples, you know, uh, marriages have great sex. You know that why? Be because, isn't that what we want? I mean, we want, we want what God gave us to be awesome to be everything that it can be. So, as we begin to look uh, at our topic this morning, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite writers. And C.S. Lewis, uh, he did the Chronicles of Narnia and, and, you know, great kids series, and they had the movie Narnia out and all that. But C.S. Lewis began uh, his early adulthood as an atheist and uh, was very vehement about his denial of God. But later in life, came to be one of the most devoted followers of Christ uh, that our century is known, and one of the wisest, most pro prolific writers. His book uh, that uh, he wrote on the uh, 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 understanding pain is just unbelievable. I couldn't even run and listen to it because it was so in-depth. And he wrote a book called Mere Christianity that just rocked my world. But in Mere Christianity, he's talking about sex. And he said, you know, he goes, the world has a tendency of saying what the Bible says about sex is very Victorian, and this prudish uh, understanding of sexuality has created all kinds of problems because it's all been hushed up. And he goes, but, he goes, un, he goes like the, the food appetite, he goes, if we ever went to a country different from our own, and we saw that they had all these strip clubs, and when we went into a strip club, they would start the music, and someone would walk out onto the stage and set a platter. And then very slowly, they would pull the veil back to reveal a mutton chop or a piece of bacon. And everyone drooled and, and screamed and cheered, and then the lights went out, and, you know, and then they brought out the next plate. He goes, we would probably think to ourselves, 
these people have a weird understanding of food. He goes, we might even be deluded into thinking that the problem is there's not very much food in their country and they're all starving to death and because they never get to see good food, it is alluring to them. And he goes, but on further research, we find out not only do they have lots of food, but they indulge over and over and over again in every kind of food. He goes, because it's not just the starving that think about food, it's also the gorged. And the same thing happens with sex. He goes, if, if people from another society came and saw our obsession with sex in commercials, with, our, you know, with sex everywhere in our society, they might think the same thing that we would think because we become desensitized to it. As we begin to look, I want to read a couple of passages. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says this, Flee sexual immorality. All other sins that a person commits are outside of their body, but the one who sins sexually sins against their own body. Now what I believe is the heart of this passage is that sex touches us at the deepest level of our life. It is the most intimate, most vulnerable place we can ever be in relationship with another individual. Anybody ever heard this term? Sex changes everything. Everything. Sex changes everything. Because it touches us at the deepest, most personal level of who we are. As we look at victims of sex crimes, as opposed to any other crime that you would ever see, you know, people, you know, even with violent assault and whatnot, you know, they may be afraid to be out alone and whatnot, but rarely does it touch the way that sexual crimes do. Because it touches us at the deepest part of who we are. Now, a lot of us think that Bob Seger is a prophet. That somewhere, there can be a reality that says, I used her, she used me, and neither one cared. We were just getting our share working on night moves, that somehow I can disassociate myself to such a degree that sex doesn't affect me at all. Just something that I do for fun, for pleasure, for recreation, and it doesn't have an effect on me. I don't believe that. I believe it always touches us at the deepest level. I believe, as Scripture says, that we can become so uh, calloused that we don't feel it anymore, that we can get that far, but I believe it still has an effect. In Ephesians 5.31, we read these words, For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother. He will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Sex was intended to make two people one. And there are very, very powerful things that are going on that Jennifer is getting ready to share with you here in just a second. But one more verse. Ephesians 4.17 says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. For in the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they give themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. He says if sex ever becomes something other than bonding people together, if it becomes something that is less than that, we lose our sensitivity and we continue to give ourselves over and over and over and over with a continual lust for more. Now, Jen's going to share with you uh, for just a minute uh, why that happens. Jennifer? So, verse 19 in that passage from Ephesians, having lost all sensitivity, is real. So I had lunch with uh, one of the 20-somethings, and we were talking about how they had decided they were going to wait till marriage to have sex. And I just assumed that that was for religious purposes because they were raised in a fairly conservative Christian household. And I said, oh, you know, is that, you know, for religious purposes? And he goes, no. He goes, girls go crazy after you do that. They're psycho. And I was like, you're a very wise man. <laughs> When I was, I was sexually active in high school. So if, if you're married, but maybe you have teenagers or you are in relationship with some young adults, it makes us go crazy. Have you ever looked at a young adult or a, a sexually active teen and gone, they have lost their mind. Verse 19 says, having lost all sensitivity. 
We don't think clearly anymore. And there's a chemical reason that we do this. I love how God has wired our bodies. And let me explain to you something that happens when you are sexually active. Something that happened to me when I've been sexually active. You get attached because there's hormones. There are chemicals that actually surge through your body whenever you are aroused. And now all of us have the same chemicals that get surged through our bodies, but different men have them in different levels than women do. So women have a high level of oxytocin. So whenever we're aroused, we have oxytocin rushes through our body, and it's got a nickname. It's called the cuddle hormone. Have you ever heard a woman say, just, why can't you just hold me? Just hold me. Well, we have levels of oxytocin that run through our bodies. Men have it too, but women have much more. And what this chemical does is it emotionally bonds you to the person you slept with. Now, please, I counsel a lot of women that tell me this doesn't happen to them. Uh, and I'm sure that there are always exceptions to rules. However, I, I just don't know how physically that isn't happening. It's why I went crazy in high school. And a guy tried to break up with me, and we were sexually active, and I said, no, you're not going to break up with me. <laughs> you don't mean that. And I probably called 50 times a day, and thank God there wasn't Facebook or texting, because it would have been a mess. <laughs> I couldn't let go. He was horrible to me, and I couldn't let go. If you have found yourself in a relationship over and over and over, and you've been treated poorly, you come into a counselor or a pastor's office and you say, I don't know why I put up with this, I don't know why I put up with this, and the next week, oh, we're good now, and the next week, I don't know why I put up with this, I can almost always look at a person and say, are you having sex? And they will almost always say, yeah, but what does that have to do with it? As females, oxytocin is running through your body. As males, and females have this too, but males have it much more, there's a chemical called vasopressin that's actually raging through you. And it's an interesting chemical. It's called the imagery bond chemical is its nickname. And what it does is a couple of things. One, it's actually a chemical that releases, releases kind of a possession reaction. I belong to you, you belong to me. Like this is actually the, kind of where we get some ownership in our relationships. The other thing it does is it kind of takes a picture of what you just saw. Which is why, while women can have issues with pornography, men generally struggle with it much more. Because every time men are aroused, high levels of vasopressin rush through their bodies, and there's a photo. There's a picture. Now, for me, this is what I love about this. My husband, my husband has the blessing of being able to say that he waited till marriage. I don't. I don't have that. I can't say that. But my husband can. So what that gives me comfort and peace to know is that that's the main image he has in his head. I am who he sees most of the time, I hope. You know, I am, I am the main image because I'm the only one he's done that with. How crazy is it that God would wire us that if we only slept with one person, we would be emotionally bonded, we would be possessively bonded, and we would be imagery bonded to that one person. That's how it's designed to be. But it's easy to get off track, and it's hard to let that become dysfunctional. John's going to share with you a little bit about sexual addictions. So this imprinting is the way that God designed us. It's what He wanted for us, because here's the thing. Anybody here been married over 20 years? I'm, I'm getting ready to celebrate 30, right? Woo. Yeah. 30 years this year and I'm telling you what, I want that woman every night. Oh, God. I am so glad that God imprinted me with chemicals that I don't go, we've been married 20 years, let's just, let's drop that sex stuff, right? You know, I mean, forget that. What, who needs that garbage anymore, right? Now, we don't have sex every night. Okay, thank you. But she has the opportunity. We don't, we don't have she to. Has, she has the opportunity, oh, and she God. has the grace to turn it down, and, and we go on. But, but that's the way that God, I believe, wired us up, that we would not just desire each other for a while, and then not, we would desire each other until death do us part. He wants us bonded, linked. And I really do believe that. I believe that, that sex should be wonderful in your golden years, in a different way, but equally wonderful, you know, I mean, 
I'd love to tell you it's as loud and rowdy as it was in the early days. You know, sometimes it's a little more mature love, but you know, okay. we can be honest. So, but are you trying to more genuine and more real now than ever? So, as we go through this, the thing that we need to understand is that God has wired us to desire more, to have that bonding to bring us together. Now, what happens if we eat unhealthy? We end up with sexual addictions. If we start gratifying things in a way that is not going to draw us to healthy, they do draw us in the same way to things that are unhealthy. Now, a sexual addiction, I've got the definition. Sexual addictions are those who engage in persistent and escalating patterns of sexual behavior acted out despite increasingly negative consequences to self or to others. They become addicted to the neurochemical changes that Jennifer just spoke about that take place in the body during our sexual behavior. Sexual addiction has many different forms. Compulsive masturbation, sex with prostitutes, anonymous sex with multiple partners, uh, multiple affairs outside of committed relationship, habitual exhibitionism, habitual voyeurism, inappropriate sexual touching, repeated sexual abuse of children, and also episodes of rape in the worser cases. As we begin to look at what happens, that passage, if we give ourselves over to sensuality, we become uh, uh, desensitized to it, and it draws us, those chemicals continue to draw us into a deeper and deeper in place with a continual lust for more. That's the reason Scripture warns. If we eat unhealthy, we're going to end up unhealthy. If we have unhealthy sexual patterns, they are only going to get worse, and they are only going to move forward unless we do something radical to change that. Why? Because our bodies produce chemicals that are supposed to bond us together and keep us passionate till death do us part. So we have to understand our chemistry is working to drive us in these directions, and if we're driving those things in healthy places, that's great, but if we're not, it's going to drive us into unhealthy behaviors. And so we have to take a look at, uh, and when we talk about pornography, uh, uh, for men in particular, pornography is all visual. Uh, you know, it's all about what you see because of our particular bent in the way that the hormones work in our life. Uh, the other thing is, pornography is a fantasy. It is people's fantasy that they pay other people good money to act out because they know that if they can continue to make those fantasies deeper and deeper, people will continue to go. The porn industry is one of the most lucrative industries in the world. Always has been. Why? Because you got to constantly draw people in deeper. Which brings us to shades of gray. Right now, one of the most popular books in America is talking about... Uh, masochism, domination, uh, all, of the, all of the what we would call perversions because they don't build up and make a person feel better about themselves. They degrade and they humiliate for, the, uh, for sexual pleasure. I personally don't believe anyone, you know, I mean, and I haven't read the books, but I read the reviews. I read many reviews on the books. The uh, New York Times, which is not known for their heavy conservative uh, Bible Belt values, titled their article, Mommy Porn. And the reason is because it is. I mean, there's no way around it. It is written to be erotic. It is written about subject matter that you would never want an impressionable, an impressionable young person to ever read because they might actually believe that there's some truth to that. Now, I'm not saying people don't do that but that somehow that is something that will bring you incredible relationship with another individual. Every one of the blogs, all, all the women that were in the blogs writing about it as I, as I was reading say, you know, I'm not much into the S&M type stuff, but the storyline is so good. And I go, okay. What I've done is I'm sucking down a bunch of stuff that I don't, and all of them said, you know, I would never want a young person to read this. You know, I would never want, you know, this. But the story is so good, I'm going to, and it says, when we give ourselves over to sensuality, with the continuing lust of more, we lose sensitivity. We get to where we can just read across stuff that we don't agree with, that we would never, ever give our teenage daughter and say, you know, here, check this out. But we become desensitized. 
Jen, why don't you share a little bit on that? Uh, and a different angle, a few years ago, uh, someone made a comment to me about chick flicks. And I called it female porn. And I thought, well, that's not fair. It's romantic. That's different. You know, go, both those movies are actually some of my favorite movies. And actually, Matthew McConaughey, I don't mind watching a movie where he's in it. It's not <laughs> difficult to watch. He's fairly good looking. I also think Jude Law is super cute. I mean, like, this is what happens is they're like, they're so handsome. And then in the movie, no matter how many women they've slept with or how many women they've really hurt and done a lot of damage or how many times they've cheated or how they can't keep a job, I mean, you get the list a mile long. But at the end, the good girl wins and they come back and they say, but I loved you always. And we go, oh, I want a marriage like that. Here, here's what's difficult is no one does usually, I mean, I don't know, it's possible, but I don't know many chick flicks that have sequels. Let me tell you why. Because after they have the kids and they're tired one night and he does something that irritates her, she starts talking about all those women that he slept with <laughs> and about all the ways he couldn't keep it together and he couldn't handle himself earlier in their relationship and why isn't, or maybe you were romantic back then. I mean, you get my point, right? Because it paints a false reality. That's not how life is, and it creates standards, both, both pornography, like we typically think of it, as well as chick flicks. It creates standards that are unrealistic, airbrushed bodies, accepting standards that are actually unacceptable. I mean, I have two sons, and I would never say, I hope that one day I see you on a conference call breaking up with four women just to turn around and sleep with another one. Go, Kyle. You go. <laughs> I would never do that. What do I drive home to my kids? You are to honor women. You are to be godly men. You are to restrain yourself. Whether it's for religious purposes or because you know eventually they'll be crazy if you don't. <laughs> you are to do... I, I mean, sometimes we, we put these standards in front of our eyes and in front of our kids that we would never encourage them to do or to be. We even, and, and this is for the single people, we even date people we would never encourage our children to date. So I have a lot of friends that are single again, and we find ourselves in these cycles and in these patterns, and, and then we, we, we don't take time to stop and look back and go, would I want my son to behave that way? Would I want my daughter to behave that way? Is that the standard I would want to raise up for them? I've heard often that sex is just physical, that it doesn't matter. Or I often hear, I can't help it. I just have to have sex. I do believe it is physical. I do believe, especially once you turn a corner, it's really hard to stop things. I do believe it is chemical. I believe God desired for it to be amazing and for us to bond each other. But you can't tell me that it totally doesn't connect to you. We're going to talk a little bit about um, what is appropriate when it comes to sex. And I'm going to speak a little bit about before marriage. I know this is Victorian. I know this is old school. But I actually encourage people to wait before, to have sex in marriage. I know it sounds so, it sounds so, I work with the 20 something, so I'm sure that even sounds more bizarre. College age students, high school, I remember how I was. I actually encourage that. I encourage my friends that have actually been married before to wait. I've had people in my office and I've said, you know, they're in the midst of, of going into their next relationship after a divorce. And I had one girl look at me and, and I said, I said, really, let's do something different this time, this time around. Because this is the other thing, and I'm going to sound like Dr. Phil here for a second, but when we have sex before marriage, how's that working for you? In that relationship that doesn't work and you cycle back in and now you're in and out of it and in and out of it and in and out of it, what about just doing something different this time around? And I looked at her and I said, this time around, when you're out of a, you're out of a rough marriage and now you're looking to date, what if this time around you date well and you don't have sex? And with all sincerity, she said, how long? <laughs> and I said, well, I know I'm a pastor, so you're probably expecting this response. But till marriage. And her expression was, with sincerity, I don't know if I can do that. And you know what? I got to thinking about it. I thought, well, Sal did it, and Sal and I waited. Why is that so difficult? I think for women it's difficult because we think that's what people expect. That we, this in our society, and men too, this has just become the norm. It's just physical. It doesn't matter. You just sleep with someone. Might as well get that stuff out of the way. Might as well figure out what that's going to feel like. If that's going to work, if not, you can move on. But we don't move on into healthy relationships. I actually encourage, if you're outside of marriage or you're single again or you've been single, for you to wait. Wait to have sex. 
for so many reasons. It's not just physical. That's why when we've been raped or molested, oftentimes our sexuality is skewed. You either become like, uh, you draw up a million walls and no one can touch you, or you allow everyone to touch you. Because at some point in your life, you've got a wound. Don't tell me it's just physical when it creates that deep of a gap that you begin to react that way in life. Outside of marriage, I believe sex, within marriage, I believe sex is beautiful. Outside, it creates a lot of dysfunction. And I know that's old. I feel, I feel like so not cool to say that. But I believe it. And I've experienced both sides of it. John's going to share a little bit about within marriage. You know, as, as we begin to look at what we really want, because what I really, really, really wanted was I really, really, really wanted a healthy marriage. How many people came from divorce? Right? I was a child of divorce. I wanted a healthy, healthy marriage. And originally I started off because I was a virgin when I got married. I've, I've slept with one woman in my entire life, and it is my wife, Paula, the only woman I've ever had sex with. People do that. Jennifer shared with you that she had sex in high school, but when she started dating Sal, she did what she is asking us to do, which is she refrained from having sex with Sal until the day that they were married. Now I realize that people miss that goal. Paul and I, baby, we barely crawl across the line. I am telling you, barely made it across the line. I mean, it was toenails and fingernails and dirt. Okay. Thank you. We got it. Just wanted to make sure I made the point. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Good. But, but we made it. And we made it because we had this unbelievable commitment to Christ and really a commitment to each other. Because I believe down to the core of everything that I believe that if we have a deep commitment, you can add pleasure and sex to it and it is an awesome thing. But if all you have is pleasure and sex, adding commitment to it is not an easy task. I'm going to tell you a couple of the benefits that came from that in my life. The first one is it created an incredible trust between my wife and I that when, quite honestly, I got married at 23, we dated for three years, and if we had ever had sex at any point in our 20s, after we were engaged or otherwise, 90% of Americans would say what? Big deal. I mean, nobody would walk around, oh, you're engaged and you had sex? Are you kidding me? I mean, there's almost this flippant, nobody makes it to marriage. Nobody ever does that. Nobody, you know, I mean, you know, nobody would have cared. Nobody would have looked at us horribly except for maybe the prudest of Christians. It wouldn't have cost us hardly anything. And yet what we did was we said, we are so committed to Christ and to one another that we are going to fight against every urge to do what is healthy. And in the last 30 years, the one thing that Paula and I have never struggled with is jealousy or lack of trust. Because now, when it would change everything, it would destroy our marriage, it would affect our kids, it would, it would ruin my job, my career, everything. What a grace it is to look and to go, I know this person can say no. I know that they can do that. Let me tell you one of the most devastating insecurities in a relationship is when you have no confidence that your mate can say no. They were never able to before. They were never able to when you were in that relationship. Can God heal some of that stuff? Absolutely. But how much better to establish it at the front? The second thing is, it's great, as Jen said, to not have a whole bunch of stuff in your head. I talked to a uh, a guy this past week, and he goes, you know, I'm so glad I'm not the man that I once was. I'm so glad God has changed me. And he goes, but I, I just wish that that old garbage still wasn't in my head. Because I wish I just didn't have to struggle with it. I didn't have those regrets. I didn't have those struggles. And that's the second benefit. You don't have to carry a bunch of junk around with you. 
It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of work. But I believe it's incredibly worth it. Jen? Oh, all right. So, um, what do we have? Oh, add? you know what yeah, I mean? you, Sorry. <laughs> I missed a point. I apologize. So, <laughs> what? A, I apologize. I didn't read my notes well. So, what about boundaries within marriage? That, that, that's where I'm getting ready to go right now. <laughs> when we talk about what makes marriage vibrant, okay? So, we're supposed to be pulled together. Here's some of the stuff that we have to deal with. The world around us is pushing fantasy on us, whether it's Shades of Grey or sitcoms or television shows. I mean, you know, they're constantly putting this stuff out. Here's what I believe makes a marriage strong. It's when two people continually and consistently love, honor, and cherish each other in every moment of their day that they fight for healthy, they fight for relationship, and their sexual relationship is about their unity and their relationship. And I believe one of the things that, that our very, very open society does to us is we end up wanting to do something that, does, that, that, that hinders that. Now, here's the thing. I think the most erotic, you ready for this? I like that word. The most erotic thing that a man will ever experience in a sexual relationship is a woman who totally and completely wants to be with him. It isn't about an act or a position or it's a, I am with a woman who totally wants to be with me. And I believe the reason that sex and marriage is so much less than what it ought to be is because somewhere along the line we've done something or we've created junk that we still carry junk into our beds with us. And there's a hesitancy. What creates that? When it stops being about us and it starts being about pleasure on its own. Now let me tell you what, I hope you have fantasies. You know, if you have a fantasy to have sex with your, part, you know, with your spouse on a beach, I hope you find a beach and have sex. You know, if you want to relive your teenage, you know, uh, fantasies and you have sex in the back of a pinto, I hope you have sex in the back of a pinto, you know. I, I, I don't know, you know, what in the world you may want to do. But if it's to make you and your spouse closer and healthier, go for it. But the second that we start to gratify a fantasy that is not about drawing us closer together, it's about playing games. What we begin to communicate is you're not enough anymore. You're not enough. I want you to pretend to be somebody else. I want you to pretend, you know, to do this. You're not enough. I had a guy come into my office at one point. And he just broke down and he wept. And he said, I thought I had the greatest situation happening. He goes, I broached the subject with my wife about inviting someone else to have sex with us, and she was open to it. And he looked at me, and he goes, and she no longer wants me unless there's someone else there. And he goes, I thought it was going to be this great erotic experience, and now she doesn't want me alone anymore. He opened a door into a game that is devastating his life. The second thing is, what we do, does it, does it build each other up? Does it show love? Does it show compassion? Because I'm going to be real honest, and all of us already know this. We, we talk about making love, and it is. But once we start toward climax, folks, it is not about how is this working for you. It is a taking business. I am using your body to, to satisfy my urges, and you are using my body to satisfy yours. And here's the great news. When you're in a healthy relationship and you love someone, sacrificing to give somebody else pleasure, you know, is awesome. It is incredible. I do it every day for my kids. I reach in my wallet and I hand them money they don't deserve to buy things they don't need. 
And I love sacrificing for them. I love taking most of my paycheck and sending it off for them to use, you know, to better their lives. Why? Because I love them. I want to sacrifice to, to give to them. I want to do that until the day they start getting all snarky. Well, Dad, I need more of that. I need more of that. And I'm like, you'll get a stick and like it, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't mind sacrificing when I know that what I'm doing is, is healthy and respected. But I don't want to give when it is not. Couples, if you're going to have healthy sexual relationships, you are going to have to talk about what's going on. And if I am ever doing anything or the other person is ever doing anything that in the least bit makes me not want to be, participate, if I don't get aware of that and change that, in the long run, they will start to check out. That's the reason I said the most erotic thing a man will ever experience is a woman who 100% wants to be there. And anything that I would do that would cause Paula not to 100% want to be there, I don't care how much I think it might be interesting or fun, it is death to my relationship. We can be as creative as we want to be, but we need to make sure it's mutual and that both people come out of it going, that is something I can give myself 100% to. It doesn't degrade me. It doesn't make me uh, want to stop or cringe or any of that other stuff. That's where health is found. And anything short of that almost always creates reluctance, and reluctance ends up being discontent, and discontent ends up being uh, sexual repression. So what are we asking you to do? Well, if you're married, we're asking you to have great sex. Not sure about the bumper sticker, but because I can just picture myself in the car rider line. <laughs> Someone sitting by me. Oh, she goes to God, why? She has great sex. That's great. Um, so explaining that to my kids' parents, um, my kids' friends' parents. So um, we are asking that. If you have found yourself in a marriage and sex is not as much as you want, you don't know how to discuss that with your partner, maybe you have discussed it and it doesn't seem to matter, a couple of things happen. Woundedness, John talked about the baggage that we bring into a sexual relationship. Women feel insecure. You know, we've been married for 12 years. I said the first service, I didn't know how long I'd been married. Um, we've been married for 12 years. So if you're in here and I'm wrong, yell it out. Um, so, and, and it's been a roller coaster in our sexual relationship. But after I had two kids, you know, I wasn't so excited. Mainly not because of anything to do with him, but because I didn't want him to like find all the new roles that had appeared and, and it felt uncomfortable and I didn't like the way I looked, I didn't like the way I felt, I was felt I was exhausted. And so we went through a rough season. You know, there's stuff that goes on in women's minds and then guys have the same insecurities too. They're not absolved from that. If you're not having enough sex in your marriage, you need to talk about it. It might be a wound from the past, it might be something you said. If you're withholding sex as punishment in your marriage, you need to talk about that too. That's a love and respect cycle. And women often, and men can do this as well, but women will hold sex back because we don't feel like we're getting enough love. And that's a two-way two street, meaning the guy has to make sure, what's that phrase? Women are like crock pots and men are like microwaves. Right. Sex starts in the morning with hello, good morning, how are you? Hope you have a good day. That's when that kind of stuff starts for women. For guys, it, you know, whenever, you know, <laughs> whatever. I'm supposed to talk for men, thank you. Uh, thank you, I'm sorry. It's whenever. <laughs> So if you're married, we're asking you to think, out, and, and, and for all people in here, whether you're married, you're single again, or you're single, you have not been married yet, whether you're sexually active or you're, you are not, I am asking you to step back and take a look at what you're doing and the patterns that you have found yourself in. If you are single and you have found yourself in dysfunctional relationship after dysfunctional relationship, and the pattern goes and goes and goes, I would imagine, and I know this won't always be the case, but I would imagine you are having sex with all those people. And that's why... That's why it's not working. We have to try something different. We have to change it up a bit, and this time restrain ourselves and see the kind of relationship we end up in. If you are single, what are we asking? We are encouraging that you abstain from sex until you are married. I know, again, I feel like so, so not cool to say that. But we say it because it matters. And it makes a difference. That's why having sex before hasn't worked. That's why this time it needs to be different. 
And if you've caught yourself, as so often the people that I counsel, in a situation where you're saying, no, it is different. Oh, you don't get it, Jen. You know, it's just physical for me. Or, or this is the person I'm going to marry. That's my favorite one. Um, this is the person I'm going to marry. I'm just asking you to step back and take a look. Is your relationship this time around any different than the one before? And are you possibly attached because chemicals have attached you and you're not even with someone that you would recommend your children being with? Just step back and ask. You know, when John and I were preparing to talk, it was funny because I was sitting in his office and I started to cry because when you work here, you cry more. <laughs> and because to be honest, and, I, and it breaks my heart to sit and listen to us put ourselves in the same situations over and over and over and I think if it breaks my heart, I think God is devastated. Not because he has some rules or wants to punish us or he's mad at us for having sex. He loves sex. But because he knows that's not what we want to do. That's not who we want to be. And we keep thinking that if I just have enough sex, it will fix that. It will change that. And it doesn't work. And it's not working. It's because we take it outside of the boundaries that God has designed for it to be in. We take it and we, we try and make it something else. But if we would just let it be what it could be, I know it's difficult. You know, I have, I have friends that are single in their 30s and 40s. I know you're lonely. I know that it's hard that at night, when your friends that are in relationships are going out with, with their spouses or, or whatever, and you are sitting home alone, all you can think about is, when am I going to find that person? And that's why when you find them, it ends up going from zero to 60 so quickly. Because I know it's difficult. It was tough for me at 16, 17, 18. I can't fathom what it would be like to enter the dating scene again right now. I know that it is difficult. It is so difficult, but it is worth it. It is worth it for what you pass down to your children, for the relationships that you'll walk into. It is worth it. And it is possible. We can do that. It is possible to not have sex until we are married. <laughs> Difficult. Apparently, John crawled, toenail, I mean, like, you know, you know that whole, and out, that illustration, it was good. Um, <laughs> it's hard. It's difficult, but it is worth it. We want to encourage you to wait. If you, if you have not had sex yet, we want to encourage you to continue until you are with the one person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. If you have had sex, like I did, we want you to know that Scripture says you are a new creation. You are new. When, when I had to tell Sal everything that I had done in the past, it was one of those moments of like, okay, we're dating, and I think he's super neat, and I really like him, but now I have to tell him all the stuff that I did. And he's perfect, so here we go. This is going to be great. He's not perfect. You're not wherever you are, you know. And I'll never forget that day. People have heard me share this story with the 20-somethings often, but I started to cry because I was sorry that he had been able to wait and I had not. And so I began to tell him, the list of things that I had done. And when I was done, he looked at me and he said, if God sees you as pure and as brand new and as white as snow, who am I to see you any differently? I know, all right, right? Yeah, he's good, he's good. <laughs> That's why I married him. <laughs> that, it's true. There's no, John and I will be here after the service, just like we were in the first service. And last year when we even spoke about this, there's nothing you're going to come and tell us that you are not able to move forward from. There's no one in this room that can't make a commitment today to walk toward health in that direction. There's no one dating that can't look at each other this morning and say, we're going to do things differently from this point forward. We had a couple after the first service that came up to me and they said, you know, we had just talked this weekend about how we are dating and we have decided we are going to wait. And what you shared confirmed that it is the most valuable decision we will make in our relationship. I encourage you to recommit yourself, recommit your relationship. If you're, you know, and if you're married, I encourage you to go and have a conversation. Apparently, John's going to encourage you to go fulfill some fantasies and pintos or whatever. Um, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, like, like that's probably too much information. I mean, yes, if you think about that stuff, and then when you get older, it's like, oh, but my back hurts, my hip gets caught. It's like... It's just a different animal later when you're fulfilling fantasies. <laughs> you're like, ow, cramp, cramp, cramp. Um, anyway, 
Sorry, it's, now it's, it's, it's me going right. too far. I ate that stuff on, I'm I sorry. Know, I, I encourage you to take a step back from your sexual relationships, regardless of where they are, and ask if they are healthy. Ask God if they are healthy. He'll let you know. I always already knew. But I kept thinking in high school, especially, if, if I kept sleeping with him, he would love me. And he didn't. And that's okay. Because the next time around, I did it the right way. And I won. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Yeah. And now we'd like to welcome a couple to the stage that dated for eight years before they became married and they waited all eight to consummate their relationship. And they're going to sing a song. Let's pray. Father, Lord, what we're talking about touches every one of us in our lives personally, in the lives of our friends and our children. And Lord, every one of us were designed by you to have deep and passionate relationships. We were designed that sexuality would be a huge part of who we are. God, give us the ability to use it in such a way that it blesses and doesn't uh, create uh, unhealth. Lord, for every single person, I just pray that you would give them the ability to find the person that they uh, would be able to be a life partner with. Lord, that you would give them uh, that incredible gift of someone that would love them so much that they would commit to them for life. And that, Father, they would be able to date in a way that uh, makes that relationship as healthy and as vibrant as it can possibly be. Lord, for every one of us that are married, Lord, that if we need to uh, right the ship, Lord, give us the ability to do that. Lord, if we need to reconnect or uh, find and discover what we lost or, or where we hurt or wounded each other along the way, that, Lord, you give us the courage to do the hard work that it takes to get back to what we once had. Or, Lord, for those that might have never had it, that they would discover it for the first time, what is live and healthy. Father, we know that you are not in heaven, freaked out, going, you've done something or gone so far or messed things up so bad that I can't fix them. You are the God who heals. Old things passed away and everything new. Make it so in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.